Welcome to this week's episode of The Read Out Loud, a weekly biotech podcast from STAT. I'm Meg Terrell. I'm Adam Feuerstein. And I'm Damian Gordon. It's Thursday, July 27th, and here's what we're going to talk about this week. Biogen had the chance to relieve Wall Street of its concerns about uh, its credibility. Things didn't quite go that way. We'll discuss. We'll also go over the rest of the news in the life sciences, including an insider trading scandal that Adam is extremely excited to talk about, and the latest concerns about Wagovi. All that after a word from our sponsor. Hey there, my name is Nicholas St. Fleur. I'm a science reporter here at STAT, and I host our health equity podcast called Color Code. Our second season started airing this spring, and in it, we're taking things local to my hometown of Long Island. Where you live has a huge impact on your health, and Long Island is a microcosm of racial health disparities that exist in suburbs across the country. We've spoken to families and to advocates about how they grapple with issues like environmental racism, segregation, and food deserts. We've heard from scientists and researchers about how redlining of the suburbs continues to create health disparities seen today. And I've explored the ways that racism has impacted my own childhood growing up here. Episodes air every other week through the rest of the summer. Racism in medicine is a national emergency. Together, let's raise the alarm. So let's start with one of the evergreen topics of this podcast, Biogen. Um, (laughs) Damien, what were people sort of going into the earnings call this week hoping to hear? And what was what did they actually hear? Yeah, it was interesting. It was an interesting setup for Biogen's, you know, otherwise probably unremarkable second quarter earnings call. Every company does these. Biogen in particular, their business rarely delivers surprises in terms of like profits and losses. People kind of get what's going on. But it was the latest opportunity for new CEO Chris Wiebacher to kind of address his public in the form of analysts and investors who, um, you know, really set the tone when it comes to how we talk about Biogen and coming into this one, something we discussed um, at some length in this podcast was a, I feel like boardroom scandal is not overstating it, that took place last month in terms of the succession of a longtime board member named Alex Denner, who was replaced by Susan Langer, a biotech executive who also happened to be his romantic partner and the mother of his child, something Biogen did not disclose. Um, You can refer to our old episode on that if somehow you missed it. Now, it's not something that Biogen had discussed, despite the fact that it has clearly been on the minds of analysts and investors from um, from our conversations with them, from it was the only question submitted at Biogen's annual meeting at which Susan Langer was elected to the board. Uh, the question being, why didn't you tell us about this relationship before asking us to uh, to vote for her? And so naturally, it came up on the call. And, you know, based on the stock price reaction, Biogen stock is down since then. And on some of the commentary we saw afterward, it's clear that people were disappointed with how Chris Wiebacher responded to kind of the elephant in the room is how Evercore analyst Umar Rafat put it of this issue. But at the same time, well, I should say his response was basically, hey, look, we don't look at personal relationships. We look at people's abilities. Um, We stand by our board members. Boards are complicated. Um, it kind of he kind of just gesticulated toward something rather than saying something, and then said, "And I think there's a, that's all there is to say about that." It seemed like it was clearly a topic that he didn't want to talk about, right, Damien? It was like exactly it was brought exactly. up, but they didn't really want to talk about this. And I think it's been clear since this arose that, that Biogen would like to move on and would like for everyone else to please move on uh, in turn. And while I understand the disappointment, because this came after years and years of what people perceived as dysfunction at the highest levels of Biogen, specifically at the board, and Wiebacher's appointment was perceived as and framed as a refresh for this company that everyone agreed needed one. And so for then this thing to happen, 
uh, it felt like a reminder of the bad old days. And it was discouraging to a lot of people who had put some faith in the sort of Wiebacher vision for the future of Biogen. And so this week's earnings call seemed to, I don't know, exacerbate some of those frustrations. At the same time, I do wonder, what would people want Chris Wiebacher to say? What would they want the CEO of a company to say in public, on the record, about his board of directors that, that would, you know, kind of address these concerns? Like, what, what's a realistic way to to say something? Well, also at the point that, like, Biogen clearly is proceeding with the way things are, you know, I, I think people might have said, OK, maybe, you know, we should have talked about disclosure or things should have happened previously, but they didn't. And so now here they are. I, I don't know what Chris V. Barker can say other than to stand by what they've done. So obviously they're proceeding. Yeah, it's a difficult position for him to be in for sure. But the puzzling thing to me is just that they wouldn't have foreseen that it would be a difficult position to be in. That's I mean, maybe they did. I, I'm so curious about what the conversations were just going around that, because the acknowledgement publicly is just sort of like, this isn't a thing. Why is everybody suggesting that this is a thing? You know, Yeah, you know, the other phenomenon of these uh, earnings calls is, you know, obviously people listen to uh, for what executives say, but they also listen to what executives don't say um, or don't talk about. And, you know, in this case, the Biogen um, they didn't really talk much about a drug called Zoranolone, which uh, is being developed to treat two forms of depression, uh, major depressive disorder and postpartum depression. Uh, that drug is at the FDA. Uh, a decision on that drug uh, is expected on August 5th. It was developed by Sage Therapeutics, which is Biogen's partner. And in the past, Biogen has talked a lot about the potential for Zoranolone in both of those markets, particularly in sort of the larger depression treatment market. Uh, on this week's earnings call, Damien, they barely mentioned Zoranolone, which I think struck a lot of people as odd, just given the fact that, you know, the FDA decision is, is coming up and and then, you know, if approved, and I think a lot of people do expect the drug to be approved, obviously uh, we will all be watching closely as the commercial launch gets underway. Um, the fact that uh, Chris Wiebacher and the rest of the Biogen team didn't talk about Zoran Loan uh, hit Sage's stock. stock uh, Sage stock was down this week. Uh, people are getting maybe a little bit nervous now heading into the Paduva date. Yeah, it was curious. Not only did the drug not get its own slide in the earnings call, we're going real deep into parsing the minds of Biogen here, but this is what people do. Um, not only did it not get its own slide and did not really feature in the prepared remarks, but there were two questions specifically about it, one of which was framed for Paul Matisse at Stiefel, one of which was framed, hey, I notice you guys aren't talking about this. That's weird. Um, and despite having those two opportunities, um, Chris Wiebacher didn't really delve into the promise of this drug as he had in the past. Now, he said uh, more than once that because it is currently at the FDA, as you mentioned, with a decision date um, any day now, that he was reticent to get into it for that reason and, and, and confessed to a bit of superstition on his part, which is to say, you know, if you talk something to death while it's under review, um, you know, perhaps you will jinx its eventual approval. Um, you know, your mileage may vary with that logic, but a lot of people read into it that perhaps Biogen had sort of softened its bullishness on the potential of this medicine, um, whose approval is not so much in doubt as a whole, but rather there are concerns as to whether the FDA will find the evidence in major depressive disorder, which is a larger market, as convincing as the evidence in postpartum depression, which is a smaller one. These are obviously huge unmet needs, and, and this drug stands to benefit people regardless of what happens. But le at least in terms of like profits and losses, that's kind of how people are breaking down its value at the same time. I mean, now we're we're perpetuating this. We're eight minutes into this uh, like psychological um, dissection of Chris Wiebacher's wording, but this is kind of the job. I get, and I'm, of course, Chris knew that. But Biogen is a company that just gets picked apart no matter what they do, including by me. And so I'm I'm aware of my role in this. Uh, and so I thought about this as people were dissecting everything he said that if you remember the like really hacky media trope in 2016 of like whenever Donald Trump would speak in public, there would be someone saying like, this is the day he really became president. I did feel during this earnings call like <laughs> this is the day Chris Wiebacher really became CEO of Biogen because this is what it's like. It's it, people are pulling apart your every word and stock prices are moving based on whether you sighed at a given moment or whether you seem to use an exclamation point or a period. And well, here we are. So in other biotech news, sort of this week, um, we got some 
crossover to soccer uh, that Adam was very excited about. And I must confess, I do not like talking about sports on this podcast. And so I I sighed um, when I learned that we were going to be talking about soccer. But actually, this is pretty interesting. Adam, explain what I am just <laughs> terribly setting you up to explain. <laughs> this is the crossover episode of the Read Out Loud that I've just been waiting years to do. Uh, my my uh, my love uh, and admiration support of uh, Tottenham Hotspur Soccer Club uh, in North London now gets to be uh, biotech uh, adjacent. Wait, why are they your favorite team? I just like, how do you choose a team? In, like, a it's a long country? story. It's a long story. I won't get into it here, but uh, it uh, they they are my favorite team. Um, and, and, you know, and it's been a struggle. But anyway, um, the reason that we're talking about uh, Tottenham Hotspur is uh, the the club's owner, uh, a billionaire, a British billionaire by the name of Joe Lewis, uh, was uh, was charged uh, with insider trading by federal prosecutors here in the United States this week. Uh, it's a really the indictment is uh, I don't know. Interesting is the word to describe it. Maybe uh, like I said, he is. A, we should, a, of course, note. He insider trading in certain biotech stocks, right? Yes, and that's right. I'm sorry. Thank you, Meg. Right, <laughs> and right. So most most of the stocks that were involved in uh, in the in the charges that were brought against uh, Joe Lewis this week uh, are biotech stocks. Uh, Marathi Therapeutics is one. Solid Bio is another. Um, and according to federal prosecutors, um, what basically happened here was that uh, Joe Lewis um, he owns a he, among the many of his other uh, holdings, investment holdings, he's a, a, a multi-billionaire, has a, a healthcare hedge fund, it's called Boxer Capital, um, that does invest in biotech stocks. And in the course of their business, they receive information, obviously, from companies. Uh, they, they sit on some boards. Um, when that information got, uh, uh, you know, allegedly got uh, higher up to, to Joe Lewis, he essentially tipped off friends, girlfriends, Pilots, his his two pilots of his private privately owned uh, aircraft, uh, and basically gave them tips and gave them money to buy these stocks. Uh, you know, again, allegedly on material non public information. Like I said, the indictment. Um, it, it it's an entertaining read, I guess. I, I guess say, and, and it it just does bring to mind. You know, it the thing that I got I took up took from this when I was reading the indictment is like billionaires are kind of dumb. Is <laughs> Is what I was thinking. I don't know how you felt about it, David, when you read it, but it's like here's a guy who has you know more money than he'll ever know what to do with, um, and he's handing out allegedly handing out stock tips to friends and family. It's curious. I mean, we should note that Lewis has entered a plea of not guilty uh, this week, of course, and that of course yes. these <laughs> these charges are alleged. However, they are brought. Not just by the SEC in a civil complaint, as is common in insider trading cases, but by the Department of Justice. And so he is facing criminal charges here. But I agree with you that the indictment is an interesting read because there, there is sort of like a classical form of insider trading where party one has insider information, gives it to party two to trade on, and then the two, or you know however many parties there might be, share in the illegal gains that result. But Lewis, as you mentioned, is not in need of capital by any means. And so at least according to the charges, he sought no personal benefit from this. He was just being a good boyfriend, private jet passenger. Yeah, like he's friend. like a good bloke, right? To to use a Britishism. Yeah, exactly. yeah. <laughs> Which is curious because, you know, if you want if you're a rich person, you want to give out gifts, you could just give money, which you have and which is legal. Um, you don't need to traffic in material non-public information with uh, advice to trade on that and thus break the law, allegedly. It, it'll be interesting to see how it plays out in court, though, because there has been or, the, or there was a few years ago a few cases that went back and forth on appeals based on this notion of personal benefit because the legal definition of insider trading is a little wishy-washier than you might think. And so in some cases, when there wasn't a clear uh, benefit to the provider of the insider information, it was harder to make convictions stick. So Lewis and his legal team could make the case, I, I don't know how far this would go, but he could make the case that because he didn't profit in a literal sense, that he didn't do anything illegal. I don't know. We'll see how it plays out. Well, there's also one part of this where they're alleging that he defrauded Marathi itself because he hid how much he owned of the company because I guess it's a Canadian like domiciled company or I'm a little bit fuzzy on that, but 
you weren't allowed, no one shareholder could own more than 20%. And so he said he owned less, but then he sort of had these other funds where he said it wasn't his and he owned more. And so his ownership was something more like 24%. Um, and so that's part of this too, that is sort of interesting. I mean, and why Marathi too, and, and solid, like these, these are very, like, you really got to understand like the data on these things. And I don't know, has this guy been around biotech for a while, Adam? I, I didn't know who he was. I mean, you know, he, he invests in biotech through this hedge fund that he does that he does own. Um, and they if you look at their holdings and they own a lot of, you know, you know, typical sort of biotech hedge fund holdings, you know, a lot of small and mid cap biotech. You know, they're not just invested in Lilly and Pfizer and Merck. They're invested in a lot of these kind of, you know, call them cutting edge biotech companies trying to develop drugs and therapeutics or whatever. Um, so that's the that's their sort of bread and butter. And that's kind of I think how he gets involved in, you know, someone like that who gets involved in some of these smaller biotech companies. I guess my own, my last word on this is, you know, I'm clearly, you know, Joe Lewis is probably going to spend a lot of money on his defense. And I do hope that he spends equal or more money on Tottenham's <laughs> defense. <laughs> we need to, we need some better defenders this season coming up. And that's, that's my crossover for the podcast. Even on that same boat, I, I, have, I haven't seen reporting on this, so I don't know w- what's going to happen. But I do recall that when a very different set of charges were brought against a guy called Roman Abramovich, uh, and he was forced but to extract himself from Chelsea. If the same thing were to happen to Joe Lewis, if, the, if these criminal proceedings play out, does that change Tottenham's finances? And, and does it mean that they will have no choice but to accept the 70, 80 million euro bid, whatever it is for Harry Kane from Bayern Munich? Wow. This has completely become a sports podcast. <laughs> <laughs> Meg is like leaving the room. So we should we, we should we should move on. I actually don't mind sports that much. We should move on uh, to the next topic. So speaking of Marathi and not its shareholders and what they do with their uh, non-public information, there was some public information this week about that company and its quest to expand the use or, or really get approval for its treatment for cancer. Adam, what happened? Yeah, a bit of a setback for Marathi this week. Uh, you know, they have been pursuing uh, approval or conditional approval, actually, for uh, a KRS targeting cancer drug in lung cancer uh, called Crizati. Uh European regulators met and and essentially I- issued a negative opinion and said, you know, recommended against the approval of the drug there, which, again, is a setback. It is approved to the United States. But I think the, inter- the, uh, the reasons for uh, the negative opinion were interesting. They, they basically... The EMA basically said that because uh, there's another KRAS targeting drug already, uh, already which has a conditional approval in Europe, and that's that's Amgen's drug. It's already conditionally approved there. Therefore, um, they didn't see the need for another one. Um, and they also expressed some concerns about the ultimate benefit for this drug. Now, you know, these drugs right now are, are sort of approved based on just tumor, you know, basically their ability to shrink tumors, uh, but. Uh, European regulars want to see, uh, you know, sort of basically want to see more confirmatory data. They want to see whether or not the drug can delay tumor progression or obviously whether it can prolong survival. Uh, that study that Marathi is doing is underway. We will probably get results next year. But what's interesting about it is that uh, Amgen has done such a confirmatory study and and the results were really kind of disappointing. Uh, there was no survival benefit. Um, the benefit on tumor progression uh, was very small. Um, so I think there's a, you know, the sort of the, the take home on this is if, if everyone remembers a few years ago, there was so much excitement about these KRAS, uh, drugs, these KRAS targeting molecules. Um, you know, this was a, this was a target that was long thought to be undruggable, um, uh, because you couldn't get the protein to sort of fit into the, into the lock, so to speak. Um, but, you know, chemists figured it out. And, and we have these drugs now, but the, but the benefit of these drugs is kind of is modest and, um, you know, commercially they've not done that well. So I think it's really interesting, you know, you have this great science and they figure things out, but maybe not as much as kind of the initial excitement would have led us to believe. Hmm. Always sad when that happens because it was such a like exciting scientific development when they sort of drugged the undruggable Keras, you know? Yeah. And, you know, there are efforts underway, you know, as there are with a lot of cancer drugs to sort of combine them with other, you know, in this case, they're trying to combine it with, with PD-1, PD-L1, you know, you know uh, immunotherapies. And, and we may see better results uh, ultimately. But right now, I think you're right. It's, it's been a little bit of a disappointment. Well, having ticked the box of talking about Biogen on this podcast, that leaves only 
one other mainstay topic, which of course are GLP-1 medicines for obesity and diabetes. And- Incretin mimetics. Still trying to make it happen. <laughs> Thankfully, uh, they have provided for us um, in the form. Maybe let's start uh, with news that just came out Thursday morning on some new data on terzepatide, which is Eli Lilly's GLP-1 plus medicine marketed as Mount Jaro. Meg, what did we learn today? Yeah, so a couple new studies. I mean, I think generally solidifying the picture, we've already seen this as a, a drug that can yield very high numbers of weight loss from a percentage of body weight standpoint. We knew from previous trials up to 22% over something like 72 weeks has been seen uh, with terzepatide. Um, I think one of the pieces of information a lot of people will find particularly interesting that came out Thursday was uh, in one study, Lilly had everybody take terzepatide for 36 weeks. And then for the following year, they randomized people to either stay on the drug or come off the drug and take placebo. And one of the things about these medicines is that if you stop taking them, generally the expectation is you can't sustain the weight loss. Um, Or, I mean, I think some people think maybe you can, but like you have to really change your lifestyle and who knows, you know, the kind of willpower that may be required for that. But Look, and I don't have all the details about the kinds of counseling people got after they came off the medicine. You know, they didn't know that they had come off of it. They were on placebo. So there's all kinds of things here. But anyway, the the average weight loss after 36 weeks um, on the trial from for everybody was 21 percent. And then they you know, randomized people to either come off the drug or stay on it, people who stayed on the drug lost an additional 6.7% of their body weight over the next year. People who came off the drug on average regained 15% of their body weight. And so, you know, this is a conversation that has been had around these medicines for a while. And the companies would argue, why are you, I mean, they present it like it's a stigma toward obesity, Uh, Like you would never say for blood pressure, just because you've lowered your blood pressure with medication successfully, you should be able to stop taking the drug and keep your blood pressure down. Or for diabetes, uh, that you've been able to lower your blood sugar successfully, you should stop taking the medicine. Um, And so for obesity and weight loss, people do talk about it differently. Like, okay, you've, you've lowered your weight. Now you should be able to keep it off by yourself. But we, and we don't know what kind of lifestyle, you know, counseling or, or whatever people were doing. But it seems like it's hard, you know, if you stop taking these medicines, it's hard to keep the weight down. Yeah, I mean, this study, it obviously was conducted by Lilly and and it serves Lilly's point about um, the need to keep prescribing, keep taking and, you know, maybe most importantly, to be crass about it, keep paying for these medicines. And it seems like it's part of a conversation that we're witnessing pretty consistently. There was a study done by a, a large PBM a couple weeks ago that had some flaws and, and maybe, you know, not worth extrapolating to everything, but was looking at how many people regain weight when they stop taking these medicines and then the upfront cost of getting them on them in the first place, concluding that, hey, these are simply way too expensive. And there were some fingers on the scale of that study, but I think we can see that it was making the counterpoint to the point that Lily would like to make, which is that these drugs are really expensive. If you regain the weight, was it worth spending the money in the first place for you to lose what you lost in the early days of your exposure to GLP-1 treatments? And, you know, this is all kind of just playing out. I feel like these parties are kind of shadow boxing right now because we don't have, here's another thing we mentioned every single podcast, we don't have the long-term clinical outcomes data of using GLP-1s for weight loss in people diagnosed with obesity, but we will have them for all I know, tomorrow uh, in the form of the Novo Nordisk five-year study looking at cardiovascular outcomes for patients who fit this exact um, description. And even that will probably just, there will probably be enough in those results to arm the various parties to continue this fight for years to come, because this is kind of how these things play out when new medicines with high demand and relatively high price tags come out and the people who pay for them would like to pay less and the people who reap the revenue from those payments would like them to uh, persist. So I guess, I don't know, it's just a preview of more to come. And Meg, along the same uh, topic, you did some reporting this week, uh, you and your colleagues did some reporting this week on, on a side effect of these medicines. Tell us a little bit about that. Yeah, I should say this is pretty much all from my colleague, uh, Brenda Goodman at CNN, who is an awesome reporter. Um, She talked with uh, doctors and a few patients 
who experienced a severe form of a known effect of these medicines. So one of the ways by which they're actually thought to work possibly is uh, by slowing uh, the emptying of food from the stomach. Uh, And for a few patients, she talked with three, um, they experienced a severe version of that, which their doctors, at least in two cases, doctors called severe gastroparesis or stomach paralysis, and they thought this was caused by Ozempic and Wagovi. Um, Now, it's not clear that it was. Um, It's also possible the doctor said that these patients already had sort of a silent version of this and that these drugs could have exacerbated it. Again, not clear that they had any effect on it. Diabetes can also cause this. Um, And the FDA has said it has received reports of gastroparesis among patients taking the medicines, um, some of which hadn't resolved even after they stopped taking the drugs. And that's something that Brenda found in talking with these patients too. Even after they stopped taking the medicines, they have severe nausea and extreme vomiting Um, So much so that one of these patients who was a teacher said she had to take a leave of absence from her job. Um, You know, Novo Nordisk says that these medicines have been studied extensively, both in clinical trials and on the market. Um, And, you know, it's not something that they warn about in the product label, except that they note that um, the slowed stomach emptying could potentially affect, you know, sort of the metabolism of taking other medicines at the same time. So it's something people should be aware of. And actually, the American Society of Anesthesiologists just last month put out guidance saying folks should stop taking GLP-1s maybe a week before, if they're on the injectable version, before elective surgery, because it can be dangerous to go under general anesthesia with a full stomach. Uh, and, And so doctors are just calling for more study into this effect, better understanding of it for things like that. Um, but also because some of these doctors think that perhaps this could be a bigger problem. But right now, you know, not proven to be causative here. And happening at the same time, um, we got news this week, I think Reuters first reported it, that the UK's health authority is echoing what the European Medicines Agency uh, had already done, looking into reports of suicidality and um, the suicidal thoughts associated with taking GLP-1 medicines, not Wegovy in particular, but the whole cast of them. Similarly um, to the news with the EMA, it is a relatively small number of case reports given the large number of people who've received these medicines over years and years and years. Um, And it sounds like regulatory authorities just kind of doing their due diligence rather than something that would be cause for alarm or that would be, you know, lead to anything like a recall. But it is a reminder, at least on the on the suicidality question, which does seem, you know, different from the stomach emptying thing. It does seem at least separate from what we know about the mechanics of how these drugs work. A reminder that whenever any class of medicines becomes really, really big, statins in the past, um, just any kind of cardiovascular drug that ends up being taken by millions of people, there will be a quest to determine what is statistical noise and what is a real actual risk factor. Um, I have no idea how those investigations are going to play out. But similarly to the fight between payers and drug makers, this is probably something we should get used to hearing about um, as these drugs become more and more ubiquitous because just, I don't know, human beings are complicated and anything can happen out there. That's a terrible way to end it. (laughs) Ah, Human beings are complicated. (laughs) It's true. (laughs) (laughs) And finally, we do have some personal news to, I guess, to break on this podcast. Uh, Meg, I will let you, uh, I'll let you announce your own news. Oh, (laughs) today is my last show. I'm so sad myself. I have loved getting to be part of the show with you guys. Um, I think I started, what was it like? like the end of 2020 in the middle of the pandemic. Yeah, it was, I think it was October, 2020. Yeah. And I remember, um, then I, uh, you guys asked me to join like a stat, like, um, you guys did these like virtual meetups and like somebody was like, you talked to one, one member of the team to get to know more about them. I guess it was sort of like nice. I don't know if you guys still do that, but it was a nice thing to do, especially in the pandemic when we were all separated and you guys asked me to join one of those. And I remember somebody asking me something about like joining the podcast. And I said, it had made me realize how lonely I had been, you know, being home for so long during the pandemic, um, that I, like when I got to talk to you guys every week, like, it was like, oh, I was missing like friends from my life, you know, uh, and you guys are two of my really close friends. And I loved getting to do this with you. So I'm sad. 
but I'm also happy that I'll get to go back to listening to you every week. That was the one thing when Rick asked me to join the podcast. The one thing I was like, oh, but I like listening to the podcast. And if I'm on it, it kind of takes away <laughs> a podcast I look forward to listening to. So now um, if I can make the next announcement that Allison DeAngelis is coming back into the rule, which will be wonderful, um, I'll get to look forward to listening to you guys again. Well, Meg, obviously we will miss you terribly. I it it feels at once like much shorter and much longer than since late 2020 uh, that we've been all three of us doing this together. Um, I yeah, I don't even really know what to say. It'll it you know we'll we'll just we'll no that's terrible because it's a, I that's okay. <sighs> being a real human is not <laughs> a skill. I've honed in my 35 years. Well, it's not goodbye for us in life. It's just goodbye for us on Thursdays. I mean, you know, like yeah, this is, you know, this is obviously a sad day. I mean, we've known, obviously we've known this is coming. Uh, it's still a really sad day uh, for me personally. Because Meg, you know, working on this podcast with you, uh, you know, really has been kind of one of the bright spots of my time at STAT. And I, and I have enjoyed it working with you so much. I do remember, you know, when Rebecca Robbins left us, and again, this was back in 2020, um, and we were just sort of starting to think about who was going to replace her. Uh, and I, I remember this conversation that I had with Rick Burke, our boss, and I don't remember it was like on phone call or an email or Slack, but he said to me, you know, we have to get Meg. You know, we have to get Meg to come on the podcast. She'd be perfect. And and of course, he was right, as Rick always is right. Um, <laughs> and, uh, you know, and then you and I have known each other for years, and we have been kind of these biotech reporter adjacent colleagues, and we've worked in different places. But, you know, this was an opportunity for us to work together. And I, again, I have enjoyed it, enjoyed it so much. And obviously, this is not goodbye, because, you know, I'll probably be texting you about something <laughs> this <laughs> afternoon. Yes. <laughs> But I just, I, I do, I just, I want to just, you know, it's been great. And, and I've loved, I've loved every minute of it. Likewise. All right. Well, actually, we're not quite done. So <laughs> understanding that our own well wishes would probably be uh, insufficient. Uh, we reached out to a few people um, from the biotech world, people You've known people who've been on the show in some cases um, who wanted to give well wishes of their own. Um, why don't we take a listen to what they said? Oh, no, I'm going to cry. Hi, Meg. Hey, Meg. Hi, Meg. Hey, Meg. This is David Shankine. We'll be missing you at the Read Out Loud podcast. It's Stefan Vancel. It's hard to believe that we first <laughs> met 10 years ago in the early days of Moderna. Since then, I have been fortunate to have had the chance to speak to you regularly. Oh. Your reporting during the pandemic was an instrumental public oh. service, and we are all better off for the dedication and clarity you bring to complex topics. This is Ken Frazier. I always enjoyed and valued our interactions. Whenever you interviewed me, it was always clear that you'd done your homework, you were always prepared, but you were also very warm and gracious. This is Tony Fauci here. I've watched a couple of segments of your CNN performances, and it really is spot on, high quality. And I look forward to continue to follow you in that new role and continue to get informed on the latest news in the medical sciences. Meg, hi, Helen Branswell here. Please don't go. But if we can't have you, CNN is really lucky too. You're an amazing journalist. You always ask the toughest questions. And I and others look forward to more terrific journalism from you in the future. This is Rick Burke, the editor of STAT. I could go on and on about how Meg has raised our game on this podcast with her extraordinary polish, her crisp authority, and her ability to snag endless biotech CEOs for interviews. But what I love most about Meg is her role as BS detector for Adam and Damien. Meg is never, ever afraid to call them out. For that, I am ever grateful. Hi, Meg. Stelius here. I remember well when oh. we first met. You had just joined Bloomberg. And over time, with your writing flair, your journalistic talent, your radiant presence on the screen, you've become the star that you're now, but <laughs> yeah. more important than anything else, you've become a star with substance. I'm totally proud of you. 
Oh my god. You guys really didn't pull any punches with that one. Oh, I felt like a Meg Terrell, this is your life. (laughs) 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 I was not expecting that. Well, thank you to, I mean, thank you to you guys for (laughs) reaching out to all those folks. It was so nice to hear those voices, some of which I hadn't heard in a long time. I mean, Ken Frazier, we talked the day he announced his retirement from Merck, um, you know, and Dr. Fauci, obviously. Uh, so that was lovely. And Helen, Helen was the cherry on top. Oh, my gosh. And oh, <laughs> I, one of the joys of getting to do this podcast was getting to call Helen a colleague. What an honor. Um, and, you know, likewise for all of you guys. This is the best team in biotech. It's and broader. It's amazing. So thank you for having me this you know, last two and a half years. And yeah, someone's chopping onions in this recording studio right now. But uh, <laughs> over here too, weird. Uh, with 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 tears in my eyes. That does it for another episode of the Read Out Loud. Thank you to Teresa Gaffney for producing this week's episode. Our senior producers are Hyacinth Ambonato and Alyssa Ambrose. Our executive producer is Rick Burke, and our theme music is by Brian Jewell. And we'd love to hear from you. Tell us what you like about this week's episode, what you didn't like, and of course, your favorite Meg Terrell moment. <laughs> you can do all that by sending us an email at readoutloud at statnews.com. And if you like what we do, leave a review or rating on Apple Podcasts or whichever platform you use to get your podcasts. You guys, I can't say see you next week. <laughs> <laughs> These guys and the amazing Allison DeAngelis. We'll see you next week.